Hi, everybody. It's Rob Shapiro from In the Mind of. I had the great pleasure of talking with uh, Joseph Schwartz today. Joseph and I had met probably on and off. We kind of took courses and we kind of think throughout the the years and just taking stuff. And then I've kind of you know, talked to him on the phone and we did some, some of this kind of Zoom or Skyping at the time. So a little bit about Joseph and whatever I missed, he'll, he'll definitely fill in. But been a body worker for 30 plus years. I uh, started yoga since 1990, been in private practice as an integrated body work person teaching. He started his own, which is very cool. And you can actually see it over my shoulder, which is his book right here. It's uh, in 2015, he started the five primary kinetic chains, which eventually he launched in uh, 2017, the DNA seminars, dynamic neuromuscular assessment. Um, I think I hit them all. I know that's a lot in 30 years, but welcome. Thank you for joining me. I really do appreciate you spending your time with me today. Thank you, Rob. Thanks for having me. Sure. So did I miss what I missed? A lot of years, a lot of gaps. So I know I missed well, a ton of stuff. What, what, what did you miss? You know, that's kind of an interesting thing when we, when we start to think about the different circumstances that each of us have in our life and why we're guided to different things. Like for myself, when I was uh, in high school, I got into motocross and rock climbing, which were at the time considered very fringe kind of adrenaline kind of sports. Though what I learned many years later is that while it may look like those are fringe adrenaline sports, they require a high level of focus. And for, for many people, um, it's hard to find that focus, except for when you get put into an activity that requires your focus or else peril or injury can occur. And so some of my greatest lessons in life have been from the need to be completely present with what is happening in the now moment. So tell me a little bit about like what made you, what started your journey? I know you had an accident with your ankle. I remember kind of in class a little bit about it. Did that, what kind of started your journey on the, you went from the motor side to the you know, body side? What made you kind of transfer over or what was your, what went on in life? Or? Well, I think the real impetus really was um, in 1985, I was climbing at an expert level and I took a long fall rock climbing and I broke my talus. And it was a, a multi, multi-year multi process in healing from that injury. And along the way, I was introduced to body work and physical therapy. The physical therapist that I was working with was using manual muscle testing as one of the assessment tools to gauge progress. And this is the classical way that physical therapists are using uh, manual muscle testing to look at that scale of response from a, from a, um, a zero to a five. That led me to going back to school, getting my education in, phys- in physical education. And I found myself literally right turning into Jocelyn Olivier's massage school unknowingly like oh let's check this out and so lucky day (laughs) right and so that was in uh uh the summer of 91 and i enrolled in jocelyn's school and i was there for four years um as a student and then as a uh, student assistant teacher and so if we think about the impetus between going from literally race car mechanic to body worker. It was my own process and my own healing. And and that triggered something innate in me, my own capacity to to be um, a facilitator in, in people's progress, their experience. And this is, it started with my, myself first. And this is actually something that I talk about with my students is that we have to be our own client first because it's our experiences that are going to inform how we work with our clients and patients. So who who is your influencer? So we know Jacqueline, like I know you took a little bit in your career. There's a lot of people you've passed. Are there people who are your your influencers in your work? Um, Influencers in my work as far as um, my movement work, I would say that obviously Jocelyn has been instrumental. Uh, When I started to get into the movement aspect and looking at um, martial arts, I had um, Mm -hmm. a couple of different teachers. One um, teacher is um, a very famous uh, coach, Coach Scott Sonnen. Mm -hmm. He's been very influential in my work. 
I also worked with a period of time with uh, Dr. Eric Cobb, who went on to found Z Health. I also um, worked with other martial artists. Um, one of them, uh, Dr. Cruz, was my local jujitsu teacher. And so I think that all these experiences, you can't really just say one is the, the thing, but it's an accumulation of experiences that create this whole big picture. I mean, right. So, who, so I'm sorry. So, tell me about like DNA itself, the dynamic, uh, you know, dynamic assessment, dynamic neuromuscular assessment. Like, what is it? What's your? How'd you develop it? Um, basically, dynamic neuromuscular assessment is a way to look at movement as something that is that is tangible. If we start okay. looking at um, <clears throat> people's experience. It's very subjective. But what becomes, how do we make something that is subjective to something that is more objective and tangible? And the way that we can measure movement is something like that. And when we start looking at how we integrate in movement and the, and the different ways we can look at the relationship of efficiency versus effectiveness, um, these become very important. Like, for example, someone that has a coping strategy or a compensation pattern, that is effective movement. They're effectively being able to accomplish the task at hand. It may not be efficient, and it may not be sustainable, but it's effective. It allowed them to get the job done. This becomes something so, that, that we can measure. It's observable. When, when we're working with our clients, we can observe how they're integrating. I remember right. looking at some of the, the different works that we see in, in the movement profession, you know, whether it be DNS or whether it be um, the early movement that was with uh, the Rolf Institute, which later became um, uh, Thomas Hanna's, or excuse me, uh, Tom, Thomas Meyer's work, uh, the anatomy trains, and how, how all those different influences, there's a little bit of a different lens. And I started looking at my experience with working with Coach Sonnen in martial arts and how that has colored my own lens. And that's really what the right. five primary kinetic chains came through and the, and the five principal actions. So what is the base of you would say? Is it observational, movement, muscle testing? How would you describe, how is the system? Like what, are, the system, what are our tools for your system? So the, the tools are looking at how the nervous system is responding to movement. And that, that includes um, nervous system response using both feedback and feed forward work. For example, manual muscle testing is feedback work where the examiner is initiating a stimulus to the, to the client and the client is asked to respond to that stimulus. Feed forward is when we ask that client to move and we, that client then has an opportunity to, to organize that movement in the best way that they know how to with the available coping strategies that they have. Right. That becomes something that's very important because then we get to see their preferred strategy. And so, we're responding to movement. However, are we responding to movement in an optimal and appropriate way? Meaning, under a no or low load situation, our nervous system should have capacity to remain in a parasympathetic state. If we are activating a coping strategy, our nervous system will flip from that parasympathetic mode to a sympathetic mode. That is something that's measurable. And we can measure that through the interstitial receptors because those receptors will change the response between a parasympathetic load and a sympathetic load. And so then we can start to look at, oh, someone, yes, was able to accomplish a movement, but it's not optimal because their nervous system had to upregulate in order to accomplish it. Right, so your test would be a muscle test? What were your tests? I know you're, so for the PTs who are going to listen to this, they're going to try to figure out, you know, the, 
trying to figure it all out, but they, again, we have to take your class and understand it. But someone comes in, I have medial knee pain. I mean, that's, uh, you know, it's very, you know, myopic, but, you know, the typical patient comes with medial knee pain. How might it be, what might somebody do for that as a, if you're trying to integrate that work, even though it's, it's hard to do right. without knowing the system, but where would they start and what would, they, what would you start to look at? Well, you start looking at how the muscles that are acting on the knee are responding. What, responding through muscle testing or that would be happening through muscle tests. Now, here's the thing. Muscle response is the, the very bottom of the hierarchy of nervous system response. What's, what's higher up the chain is how the ligaments are responding to movement, how the joint capsules are responding to movement. The, the, the Golgi receptors in those structures, they're going to be informing the cerebellum through the spinocerebellar tract how that joint is, is responding to movement. And then the cerebellum is then going to instruct the structure how to respond. Here's the problem, is that ligaments are part of the non-felt sense matrix. And so we're not necessarily feeling when our nervous system is getting that upregulated response. What the nervous system then does is it temporarily inhibits muscles that would act on that inhibited ligament. For example, say you have someone that has torqued their knee and their oblique popliteal ligament is upregulated. That is going to send a message to the cerebellum to inhibit the popliteus and the hamstrings. Because if those movement, those muscles that are acting in movement, if they're acting on the knee, it's going to continue to drive up that signal from that oblique ligament. And so the, so the oblique system, ligament would be, so I make sure everybody's on the same page. So you say upregulated is being because it's torn or it's strained, or it's because there's something else that's torn, it's more stress in the ligament. Well, so people you know, understand that. So, so all those above, in addition to mm -hmm. the Golgi receptors within the ligament, they can get, I'm going to use the word stuck, where the volume mm -hmm. is stuck as like the, when a strain happens, even though the tissue right. drills, the volume still is stuck and is still sending messages to the cerebellum. And the cerebellum is responding as if the threat is still present. So the muscles around it will either facilitate or inhibit, depends on what yeah. the structure needs to do, I would imagine. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, exactly. And so this is, this is something that, that is, we can evaluate this. And it requires a, a very different kind of muscle testing than, than the traditional muscle testing of muscle strength. Instead, we have to evaluate how the nervous system is responding. And so that requires several different pieces. One is to direct stim the structure. That could mean a muscle test or it could mean a ligament test. The second is, how is the nervous system responding to that stimulus? And this becomes the big piece where we can get out of this binary lens of we can either respond or we can't respond. It's something is either facilitated or it's inhibited. We can create a non-binary conversation with the nervous system when we start to put these two elements together in a specific format. Okay, so you'll be able to do the testing, figure out what's, you know, what muscles were overcompensating for that part, then release it, and then how do you use what the, I know you use the change, you use the kinetic change to look at things, so you, I know you wouldn't, my guess is, you wouldn't just look at the knee, my guess is you would think of, uh, would you start there and you look in the chains above and below, like, how would you know where to start? I'm a student of yours, and I'm saying, you know, sure, Joseph, sure. I, I got this patient, where do I start? Right. Well, you know, so if you think about if we think about it from the mobile stable mobile perspective of, of 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 joints, the knee would be considered a stable joint. Now, right. if a mobile joint above or below the knee does not have capacity to respond to the movement environment throughout the triplanar mobility, 
the knee is going to try to brace and stabilize for that mobile joint. And so, yes, we have to open up our lens to look at why that knee becomes became strained. Why is there pain in the knee? Is it is it something local? Is there is there local right. tissue damage there, or is it something more global where the knee is trying to brace and support and protect the structure for some reason? Right. So, if there's a hierarchy in your system, would you do a mobility over stability? If you had to pick, is it or is it not that simple? Like I might pick. Mobility trumps stability. You got to be careful of where it trumps these days, but mobility supersedes, you know, stability. Would I, if I had a knee problem and I had a mobility problem, my ankle, would I want to clear that up and see what that does to it? Or is there like a system, how you would look at that? Well, absolutely. You know, and some of it is this. If we think about the nervous system as being an infinitely brilliant strategy to keep us safe, the nervous system knows why it has employed a particular strategy to keep us safe. As therapists, we need to ask the question, why? And, and the way that we can do that is through a technique called therapy localization, which is when you stimulate the nervous system and you get to where you're challenging the nervous system when the nervous system is no longer able to, to appropriately respond to that stimulus then you can use a technique called therapy localization to discern why. Meaning you stem the knee, you'd go to the ankle and you'd localize the ankle. Did that knee response change? If it didn't change, then it's not in the ankle. We're more complex than just structure. For example, the knee is related to the gallbladder. And so if we're having a gallbladder issue, it would show up as a knee problem. That's our nervous system trying to tell us, oh, there's something wrong. But if we go and treat the knee, but the problem really is the gallbladder, then we're actually not gonna be able to accomplish very much because the nervous system is going to override anything that we do because it's trying to set out a signal. Oh, there's a problem in the gallbladder. There might be a problem in a, an association or part of our emotional context. And this is how the biopsychosocial model actually integrates with structure. This is also why I'll say that movement and structure is what's tangible. Those other, those other aspects of, of our experience may or may not be tangible. Like for example, we send someone out for a lab scan we, need, we want them to get a panel because we want to check out what's happening in their hormonal system, or whatever it might be that might be affecting structure. Well, that's really just a snapshot of the past because that's going to change moment to moment. Right. And so then it becomes, well, what, what can we do? Well, the nervous system gives us that capacity because it will tell us if the stimulus is appropriate for the nervous system in that moment by having this way of measuring sympathetic load, parasympathetic load. And this is something right. that's very simple to assess, actually. So we'll have to, so this is like uh, trying to get three years of study within 15 minutes. So, you know, <laughs> interesting stuff, amazing stuff. So it's, it's funny because I definitely follow you, but I'm trying to think of people out there who are like, hmm, where can they find more information for what you do? Where would they learn? Is it best for your website, right? DNA, is it DNA? <laughs> slash assessment.com. Yeah. There's some pretty uh, interesting stuff. It's fun to. I have, I have lots of blogs that are uh, blogs that build on these contexts. And it really starts with, from my perspective, having a vocabulary of movement. Because if we don't have a vocabulary of movement, how can we speak the conversation of movement with the nervous system? That's step right. one. Step two is being able to identify how the nervous system is responding to that movement. And it's not just visual. It's also um, having the manual skill set to use manual muscle testing in a way of direct and indirect evaluation. We have to combine the two to get out of binary. And then we have to de derive what's, what's an appropriate treatment strategy so that we can restore parasympathetic homeostasis to movement. 
so that the nervous system restores the capacity to respond to that movement stimulus. And that, that's when the lens really opens up because it may not just be structural. It may not just be doing a joint manipulation. It may not be just strengthening or temporarily inhibiting a muscle. It might be something right. else. Right. So work in progress. A lot of stuff, interesting stuff. I see there your posters behind you. I have them in my office, so I kind of have people look at look at patterns. It's an amazing, uh, amazing thing you put together. So um, anything else? What's what's coming up? What's future work? What's your next? What are you into these days? Or continue well, right, to be into? Yeah, right now I'm currently working on canning all my movement work. I, I started with a program that I called Fabulous Feet, which is really um, a foot and ankle mobility program which is something that we all need because of the way that um, our social culture use of shoes. You know, we're all trapped in, in, in prison in shoes and we've lost the ability to move barefoot in a natural environment. And so we have to restore proper foot mechanics. We have to restore the ability for the tarsals to respond to movement appropriately. And so that means looking at the potential movement of each tarsal joint. And how and how we can go through that movement program. I'm just finishing up something that is called spiral arm drive, and it's about the mechanism of the push pull matrix of our arm drive, and how that integrates in, and why people have elbow problems because they're not integrating how their scapular mobility is integrating tying into their core. For example, most rotator cuff injuries are a symptom of scapular stabilization. The rotator cuff being a mobile joint is trying to do the job of the stable joint of the SC joint because the SC joint's not responding appropriately and the scapula is not responding appropriately. So the rotator cuff becomes strained. Makes sense. You get stability, right? Get the mobility around it to get stability in that. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, interesting. So there's tons to, you know, we could talk all, all day. Interesting stuff. But I recommend if people want to, you know, definitely go to your website. Some actually cool videos I've seen. So I definitely appreciate it. Um, a lot of stuff. And, uh, you know, I'd love to talk more and more over time. But uh, I definitely appreciate your time. And uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you.